the conflict in their life. All right. Tell them you're sorry, but there's ways to change the wrong to right. See, we can sit in a distant haze and watch rain clouds for thoughts of... Welcome to Ocean Water. We hope you feel refreshed by the living water of Jesus Christ as we help people receive drinking water from the ocean for free. Thanks for joining us for this weekend's message. And if you enjoy it, please share it with a friend. Hi, I'm Ryan with Ocean Water. Did you know that 75% of the world's surface is covered in ocean water and yet one out of eight people in the world have a water bottle? It doesn't need to be this way, and we aim to fix that. Now, I'm here today at the beach where I live in California, and we work every day on providing a decentralized free solution to this problem. It's called small-scale desalinization. This is where we remove salt from the water that makes it drinkable. Now, why is this important? Did you know that the one in eight people who also have the highest cost per person on the planet? That's right with the worst access and quality to pay the most for it. This should really make us angry if we follow Jesus because Jesus always cares about justice. In fact, he's going to distribute all the justice in the world when we get to heaven. Now, we provide a relatively low-cost solution in rural and remote coastal areas where these systems are deployed on really fun trips. We install these systems and also start a church and work through the church because they're the hands and the feet of Jesus all over the world, just like they've always been. Now we do this at zero cost because we've learned that you can start and operate a church from about two to 60 people for free using simple scalable tools, so that's what we do. Did you know the church is not a building, it's just a group of people, that's all. So since we started before COVID-19, it was already in our DNA to meet for free in homes and coffee shops and beaches because there are thousands of small rural coastal areas in the world with the most beautiful people and I believe God is going to use us to become friends with them and serve them and see more people be in God's family. Now we've been in this series now for eight weeks in Daniel. Today we come to the eighth major test in Daniel's life. Now at this point, Daniel's an old man, and when he started as a teenager, he was 15, he was a prisoner of war, <clears throat> he's passed all these tests, and now he's in the latter stages of his life. Some of these tests he passed in his 20s, some in his 30s, some in his middle years, well now we find himself in his 80s, and he survived through <clears throat> his third king now. Two different empires, three kings, Syrians and the Persians and this is all history they crushed the Babylonian Empire Now Daniel was such an amazing man and leader and a man of integrity that every single leader wanted to keep him on usually when you get a new administration they sort of clear house and all the people who were serving in the previous administration they're all gone well Daniel keeps getting rehired and actually keeps getting promoted and we're gonna pick up where we ended up last time that he outlasted these kings and now his grandson who gets to call him Darius Mean, who's a, a general with another guy Cyrus the Persian and Cyrus the Great now we find Daniel with his eighth test in Daniel 6 why did Daniel keep getting promoted well one his professional competence made him stand out it says so Daniel distinguished himself above all the other governors and administrators by his exceptional qualities that he planned to put Daniel in charge of the entire kingdom in Daniel 6.3. He was the best at what he did. His professional competence made him stand out. It's clear this guy is a gifted leader, but more than that, he was a student. We talked a few weeks ago, all, the le all leaders are learners, and the moment you stop learning, you stop leading. He was a student of God's word. He was a student of people, he was a student of history. He was a student of culture. The Bible says that he spent his entire life learning, and he just kept getting wiser and wiser and wiser. Now, if you make wisdom a goal of your life, there's no end to what you can do. You just keep getting better and better and better. 
There are some careers that peak really early in life. Did you know that if you want to be an Olympic gymnast, you basically peak at about age 17? So you'll be replaced by someone who's like 14, 15, or 16. Because our bodies just aren't that limber when you get into your later 20s. Certainly not into your 30s and 40s. If you're going to play in the NFL, you're going to peak at maybe 28 or 29. Now in different careers, you peak at a certain level, and then it's over. If you decide to be a man or a woman who says, I want to be wise, well, that's something that you can get good at your entire life. At 85 years old, you can be a whole lot wiser than you were at 80 or 75 or 70. It's one area you can just keep growing. Now, Daniel kept growing in his confidence, and he was more skilled, he was more effective. The Bible says in Daniel 6.3 that Daniel distinguished himself above all the others, the governors and the administrators, by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to put Daniel in charge of the entire kingdom. Now the Bible tells us in the first verses before that Darius, when he took over the kingdom, he reorganized and said, I'm going to have 120 provinces in the Babylonian Empire, which I now run. Now he wasn't Babylonian, and 120, I'll have an administrator over each one, and I'm going to have three governors over that. Daniel was one of the three most powerful men in the empire. He did such a good job that it says that he distinguished himself above all the other people. All of the administrators, all of the other leaders, by his exceptional qualities. What were those qualities? When he's into his 80s, he's getting another promotion. That's a wise leader. Professional competence. The number two reason why he kept getting promoted was because of his personal character made him stand out. It says when the administrators heard the news, they tried to find a reason to undermine Daniel and accuse him of misconduct, but they were unable to do so. They could not find anything to say against him. He was honest, reliable, hardworking, and incorruptible. He was never lazy or negligent in any task. He had more integrity than everybody else. And the third thing was his public commitment to God made him stand out. His co-workers concluded, our only chance of finding any grounds to get rid of Daniel would be to find something to accuse in his religious practices, Daniel 6.5. So they developed the conspiracy they were trying to trap him. Now it's a sad fact of life that from time to time, people will try to trap you and actually work against you. Now when that test comes, it's your job, our job, my job, to maintain our integrity. That's the challenge and the test. Those are difficult tests. They're really hard tests. They're tests that we need prayer and guidance through. When I face big decisions, I always consult God's word and I always consult my wife. That's 90% of making a good decision. Now how did Daniel respond to this new test? It says when Daniel learned that a new law had been signed, he went home and knelt down to pray as usual in his upstairs room, his windows wide open toward Jerusalem, he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done his entire life, thanking and praising God. So Daniel's enemies went together to Daniel's house to catch him, praying and asking for God's help. Why was Daniel unafraid to stand out and speak up for God? Well, he remembered that God was faithful in the past tests. He remembered that God had been faithful to him in every test that had come prior. Every one of those tests, he didn't back down. He stands for the truth. In fact, every single one of these tests we've looked at before really come down to the question, will you stand publicly every time for God? Daniel says, yes, I will. Now, God took care of him God will take care of us. God took care of us when they said, you've got to bow down to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel didn't do that. God took care of him when he had to deliver bad news and say, you're actually going to lose your kingdom and your mind. God took care of him through that. All of these different tests, every single one of them, he remembers God. 
had been faithful in the past. So when you start to get fearful, what will people think about me? What will people say about me, about the things that I believe in, the things that I value, the things that I know are right and true? Remember how God has taken care of you in every part of your life. Now the second reason he was unafraid, and this is the secret of courage, he had a conversation with God three times a day. The more conversation we have with God, the more courage we get. He knelt down to pray as usual. He prayed just as he had always done his entire life. Let me ask you a question. Do you think if you prayed three times a day and had a conversation with God, you'd have more courage in your life? Joshua 1.9 says to be strong and courageous. I have that in my garage where I do all of my work when I'm at home. It helps me be more confident, less insecure. Helps me to be more immune to the disapproval of other people. Helps me to not fear rejection. And if you don't get anything else, get this. Because the secret of standing strong is kneeling often. You know, in the last over a year of time, I've spent more time praying in my garage by myself than at any point in my entire life. And I have found that the more I pray, the more quietly courageous I feel in my life. Daniel's not worried about what other people think or what they'll try to do. God's been faithful to him in the past. Now here's the third thing that kept him from being shaken. He just goes home and done what he's done every time before. He doesn't even wince about this because he was unshaken. He knew the rewards were greater than the risk. Is it risky to break the law? Well, yeah. Will there be punishment? There could be. Daniel could have even lost his life. Peter and the apostles before the Sanhedrin said, we must obey God rather than men. Now this is important because we get this confused. We have to learn to follow God, not our culture. So we have to decide, am I going to be like Peter and the apostles? Am I going to obey God rather than men? And what's Daniel doing here? Well, he's doing passive civil disobedience. He's saying, I can't obey that law. My number one allegiance is to God. I can't put anything before that. You should have no other gods before you. That's passive civil disobedience. He says, I'm going to go home. I'm going to throw open my windows. And I'm going to pray in public. He's not hiding. He's not going, oh my gosh, I'm going to get in trouble. I might get put in jail. Something bad might happen to me. I could lose my job. Somebody might look at me in a way that I don't like. He knew the rewards of doing the right thing were greater than the risks of doing the wrong thing. The wrong thing can be devastating, so he wasn't shaking. I want us to look at a few of the benefits of standing in our faith with God. Anytime you want to defeat fear in your life, any kind of fear, there's a few things that can help us. Might be the fear of disapproval or the fear of telling people, yeah, I believe in God and I follow Jesus. Now you need to minimize the negative possibilities and maximize the benefits of doing the right thing. We need to get our eyes off of, well, this could happen, or this could happen, or this might happen. I might lose my job. I could lose my salary. I could lose my reputation. We want to minimize the negative possibilities. And we want to see it as an act of faith that can maximize the benefits of helping others. So there are a few things that we benefit from every time we stay, take a stand for God. One is we get a victory over fear. Fear is just a feeling and it cannot last. You know, whenever you have a feeling, particularly negative ones, you think you're going to feel that way for maybe the rest of the day or the rest of the week or the rest of your life. You know, when you're depressed, you feel, I'm going to be depressed. This is never going to end. The reality is, feelings always fade, both negative and positive. You know, when you're grieving, 
feel like it's never going to end. But our emotions, by their very nature, don't last, whether they're good ones or bad ones. Does fear last? No. Not at all. No emotion lasts. Every single one, the good ones and the bad ones, are just temporary. They're to be persevered through with a faithful perspective. So we don't trust in our emotions because that's not the way that we're going to feel tomorrow or even in two days. Fear is just a feeling that can't last. Fear is uncomfortable, but it won't kill us. You know, someone once said that fear is false evidence appearing real. That's fear. It's not real. Only Jesus is real. It doesn't matter how you feel, only Jesus is real. Fear is just a feeling. Fear is uncomfortable, yeah, but it won't kill us. It's something we can lean into and actually grow from. Now, fear grows when I give into it, but it lessens when I move against it. So we want to pray like the first Christians. Lord, you know the threats of the people, so make your servants speak your word without fear, Acts 4.29. Now the next thing is standing for God builds my faith and my character. We should never be ashamed to tell other people of our love for Jesus, the strength it gives us, how we're ready to suffer if necessary, 2 Timothy 1 8. And the third thing is it gives God an opportunity to do a miracle. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the pit filled with lions. He got there, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, the servant of God, whom you've been serving continually, has been able to rescue us from the lions. Daniel answered, O king, my God, God sent his angel, shut the mouths of the lions, and Daniel wasn't hurt at all. That's a great reminder for us. Daniel came out of the pit. Daniel was lifted out of the pit. There wasn't a single scratch on his buddy on his body because he had trusted God, Daniel 6. Now it also encourages other believers to stand up. Paul said, because of what I've been through, many of the Christians here actually gained confidence and became more bold in telling other people about Christ, Philippians 1.14. Now, how do you stand for God every day? Well, when you have the confidence that you get from his word every day, you get more confidence. We just finished reading the Bible over the last year. We're going to start again on August 1st. We'd love to have you join us. I believe this is where we get our quiet, confident courage every single day when we make God's Word a part of our life. God's Word never changes, so we want to make sure that we hear from you every single day. We have a simple tool that we do to use this, and you can actually just hit play, and it'll speak to you do that for you in your life. You know the average person spends four hours a day on their phone? Surely we have 10 minutes a day to hear every word from God every day and every year of our life. Now I want to be clear, this is what I expect. If you're a disciple of Jesus, I expect you to take Jesus' words to you seriously, which means that we take time to hear them and think about them every single day. This is the most important character trait and discipline that you can develop in your life, God's will. Now the fifth thing is it's a powerful example to unbelievers. Peter and John, they knew that they were just ordinary men, but that they had been with Jesus, according to Acts 4.13. What happens? Well, the king became a believer. He said, this is the God who rescues and saves us. Eighteen generations later in Matthew, we get the lineage of Jesus. And then the last thing is that we'll, we'll be rewarded in eternity. Jesus said, blessed when people put you down and speak lies about you because of me. If that happens, be happy, knowing that you'll be greatly rewarded in heaven. And remember, you're in good company. They did the same to all of my witnesses who were before you in Matthew 5. Now, every week we end our time together with a simple prayer that we would walk with God this week and follow him in our lives. Would you pray this simple prayer with me? Just say, God, thank you for this day, a new day to follow you. I repent from my sins. I know I fall short. Help me to follow you today and this week. Help me to listen to you each day through your word. Help me to serve you by serving others. 
I put my trust in you. Take control of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like you to go to oceanwater.com today. We've been developing <clears throat> our site so you can have the content that you need to learn and grow and keep moving forward. You'll find info there on God's Word, our series of water talks, all of our other beach talks, upcoming trips, a place to give. You know, generosity is a part of our worship. We're, all we, we're most like God when we give. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave. Now, in the next year, we're going to be doing work in four different countries and four different languages. God always grows our perspective until it becomes global, just like he is. Now, the more we have at Ocean Water, the more people we can help and serve. So I'd like you to go online today at Ocean Water and click on Give. You can set up a monthly contribution, and you can make it part of your worship. Thank you for being with us today, and have a wonderful week. If you'd like more information about Ocean Water Church, how to join us on an upcoming trip, how to be part of one of our clean water projects, how to financially support our movement, or even information on how you can start an Ocean Water Church yourself, please look us up at oceanwater.com. Thank you.